I, I want to say, first of all, thank you guys for uh, allowing us to come. I'm going to be honest with you. When we, you know, we first had this plan back in October or November of last year. Is that right, Brother Scott? And then COVID got us all and it got me and we weren't able to be here. And though the, the pandemic is not over, uh, there are still many people who are fighting the sickness. I really didn't know what to expect as far as you coming out. But to see you guys coming out, and I'm going to tell you something. We've seen the hand of God this week. We, we've seen it. And even when a student prayed back here a while ago, Brother Scott, this student in their prayer made evidence of their having seen the good hand of God at work this week. And that's awesome. And I want to say thank you to Brother Scott and his wife and his church family for, for bringing us and allowing us to be a part. It's, um, it's never a bad time for us to get together. De Kirk lives around the corner and, and from, leads worship around the corner from where Danny and I pastor and where Danny leads worship. And, uh, man, we hardly ever see each other. I'm telling you, three or four times a year, maybe. And this is the first time that we've sang together in years, except we sang at a funeral. Somebody brought that to our attention. Of uh, Randy, How many of y'all remember the name Randy Lamb? And Randy passed, and uh, we had the privilege to go and to be a part of his memorial service. What a great dude he was. Uh, and, and I want to say that uh, I, I didn't win first place in the golf today. Kirk did that. Danny took second. But I want you to know, as humbly as I know how, I beat Scott. So I just, I just, I want that to be known. And I'm trying to be humble. Hey, is the couple here? Is the, what, who are you pointing to? I did. Well, finish it for me. You finish it for Bruce all the time. Finish it for me. I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry. Where they at? Where's the couple from last night? Yes, come here. Come here, I want you to tell the story. So, 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 so y'all remember last night we were talking about uh, the, the time is when? Now. The time is now, and, and remember I referenced a watch. Every time we look at our watch, it ought to remind us of how precious time is. Y'all remember that statement? So I'm in the back, we're, we're, we're dealing with the books and hugging on necks, and this couple had already left. I saw them leave, and then I saw them walk back in, and they had something they wanted to share. Share the story of what happened last night. First, y'all forgive me, I didn't have time to get home and get changed before I You come. look great. That's how my wife dresses all the time, don't worry <laughs> about it. Um, so we left here, and we were headed down the road to the house, and uh Saw an older guy who's having some trouble alongside the road. Um, obviously, was struggling, trying to pull a lawnmower and push a bike. And uh, so we pulled over and asked him if we could help him. And I uh, really couldn't understand him uh, too much, but he needed to get down the road with his with his uh, equipment that he had going on. So we loaded him up and uh, and took him down to the station and dropped him off. And uh, and Tammy said, "Does he need help with anything else?" And I said. It looks like he does, um, but I didn't know. So Tammy got out, and uh, and she always carries a, a track called the Father's Love Letter, the Father's Love Letter with her, and uh, and she approached him, and um, she used your your line. She said, "I um I said Murphy, I would really love to see you in heaven someday, and um, buddy, do you know do you know who Jesus Christ is?" and he said yes, and um, I've approached other people before about that, but the, the look in his eye was a look of that he was connected to me, and, like, he totally was in the moment. And I said, well, Murphy, that does my heart a world of joy. I said, so because you know Jesus and, and I know him, I said, can I pray for you? I said, I don't know your situation, and I would just want to pray blessings over you. And um, he said, sure, and so I did. I prayed with him. and. He was in affirming in that prayer. And um, afterwards, you know, I just said how um, how much I just really have a heart for him, and I would love to see him at church tonight. I don't see him right now, but that's okay. Um, and uh, so he was talking to me about his watch, <laughs> and which, would, again, brought the sermon back to me, the time. Time is short, and I only have right now, you know. And so, and his watch wasn't working, and I and he was saying something, and I honestly could not understand what he was saying, but he gave me his watch, and I thought, well, 
and we'll take this watch and we're going to get this fixed. So um, I went to Walmart and we're trying to find batteries. So I can, they didn't have the batteries. So we just bought a new watch and, and we went back to the gas station. Okay, so we go back to the we go back to the gas station and he's sitting there. So keep in mind, I didn't see him when we pulled out. Um, I don't know where I was. I just was off looking at something else. But I Aaron's like, hurry up and pulled, and he's like, I said, what are you doing? He's like, there's a man struggling back there. And I'm like, oh, okay. So when he loaded him up, I stayed in the truck. I didn't really know what was going on, you know. And so when he unloaded him, and then we got back in the vehicle. I just kind of was overwhelmed with, well, wait, we just we just met a physical need, but what's his spiritual need? I need to do that with him. Like, I don't know him, but he just came across my path, and what we're learning is God sends us out, and every person we come across is a divine appointment. So I was like, I need my divine appointment. But anyway, so we went back, and I said, Mur Murphy, I, you know, buddy, I said, I got you a watch. I said, I want you to wear this watch. I said, time is short. We need to love Jesus. We need to serve him. And I would really love to see you tonight. And so I was praying all day for him, but I was hoping I'd see him, or I was hoping I'd see him across on the side of the road, and then I'd pick him up and bring him home. But that, was our, that was our moment, and I thank you for that message because it's always good to bring things at the forefront of our minds because we kind of, we're human. We get caught up in our doings, and we have that opportunity. I just thought it was, we needed to share that with the church, y'all, because of the message about time. And when he pulled that watch off his wrist and said, I can't tell the time. My watch is broke. I said, we got to go back and share this with you. Well, and what I love about it, watch this, is because remember there's two kinds of time. Chronos, that's, that, that's those minutes and seconds. Tick, 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 we're on our way home. Time is moving forward as we know it. But because you took the opportunity to stop and invest, now you've experienced a tireless moment in time a moment in time so you've experienced them both and anytime we will stop worrying about our watches and dare to understand the time is now god listen i guarantee you they did some cool stuff for that man but i bet the blessing was bigger to them what do you think okay that's the way it works by the way it is good job awesome thank you i appreciate that all right, Emma, where you at, girl? Come here. Bow your heads. Emma's about to pray for us. And listen, a dangerous prayer. And I warned her it was dangerous. And I told her, you, you don't want to pray this unless you understand you're praying a very dangerous prayer. And if you dare to receive what she's about to pray for yourself and make this a prayer in your heart, it's dangerous to you too. You just need to know that. I'm warning you, okay? Just warning you up front before we get to where we're going. Right here, girl. Let's pray. God, I've been comfortable for way too long. Please forgive me. I know you want to use me to show your love in this world. Give me eyes to see needs of others and a heart that dares to get involved where you are working. God, my life is yours. Whatever you want, wherever you need me, here I am, Lord. Send me. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Emma, thank you. Break me, God. Break, God, break me of whatever keeps me from maximizing your potential in and through me. Break me of that. There, there is a, a song out today called uh, Refine, Refine Me. And it's talking about burn away any dross, burn away any impurities. I want to be refined by fire. Purified. How many of us are willing to pray, God, I want to be refined by fire? God, no, I want to be refined by steak dinner at Longhorns. Amen. But refine me by fire? That's a dangerous prayer, don't you think? But here's what I've noticed. Most of the time when you and I pray, and I don't mean this in any bad way, but we pray prayers that particularly impact ourselves and those people that we, we love. God, if you would, heal my son. It's been a prayer of mine. 
I'm not ashamed to pray that prayer. God, heal my grandmother. Heal my, heal my husband. Heal my wife. God, would you help me get into the school? God, would you help me to find this job? God, would you bless me as I do such and such? And absolutely and completely, uh, we should continue to pray these prayers until Jesus comes. Nothing wrong with those prayers. But instead of just praying, God, would you do this for me? What if we stopped and we prayed this dangerous prayer, God, what can I do for you? What if we got up tomorrow morning and we just said, God, instead of doing this and this and this for me, God, what can I do for you today? Remember we talked about the blank sheet of paper? Just signing the paper and saying, God, I'm yours. Fill in the blanks, man. I'm, I'm in. Let's go. Let's get it. What if we dared to pray that way? God, I'm your servant, and I want to be available for whatever you might call me to do. And let me tell you, when we pray this kind of prayer, God could direct you in a lot of different ways. He might cause you, after revival that's gone two hours, to stop and now pour into other people before you go home and feed yourself. He might call you to go replace a battery only to find out now you're going to buy a watch. My battery quit today, too, by the way. I'm just saying. I'm kidding. Listen, he may, listen, young people, he may cause you to break up with somebody because he's got somebody better for you. Now, I know some of you husbands and wives are saying, boy, I wish you'd say that about my husband or my wife. I'm not saying that. He didn't call you to leave your husband or wife. Matter of fact, if you want a better husband, ask God to change you. If you want a better wife, ask God to change you, sir. I'm telling you, that, that'll change us. Now, all throughout Scripture, if you read from the Old Testament through the New, you're going to see that God calls people. Now, I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about that he rings you on the phone or it doesn't mean that he necessarily prompts you uh, via text or, or writes something in the sky for you to see. He, he moves them. He leads them to say something. He leads them to do something. He leads you to go somewhere when, when you wasn't necessarily going that way. He leads you to pull over when you see somebody pushing a bike. He leads you to go to Walmart. He leads you to speak the truth. God will call those who know him to do something that he wants them to do. And the question is, is will we do it? Remember the two questions last night? God, what do you want me to do? And God's question was what? If I tell you, will you do it? And then we play that game. God, but, but really, God, you tell me first, and then I'll decide if I want to do it. Well, it don't work that way. God, God does not work that way. I want to talk to you about three different responses real quick tonight that we can give to God when it comes to praying and God calling us to do something. Jonah, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. It was Jonah. Jonah responded to God's call this way. He said, watch this. He said, here I am, God, but I'm not going. Let me prove it to you, okay? Some of us can relate to that, right? He says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come, upon, come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let me stop right there. So God says, here's what's going on. I'm calling you to go to Nineveh. And I need you to go down and speak to these people. You've got to remember, Jonah hated these people. He hated them, and now God's calling them to go down and to preach to them. Went them to Jesus. And Jonah turns, and he heads in the other direction. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. Stop right there. Y'all look this way. When we run from God... You will pay the fare. It'll cost you. But if we'll do what God says, he always picks up the tab. I'm just telling you. He'll pick up the tab. He always does. And went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I wonder how many of us have had a similar experience. You felt prompted to do something. Hey, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to go here. I'm supposed to say this. I'm supposed to invite this person. I'm supposed to go see this person. I'm supposed to write this letter. And, and we were supposed to help, but not today. And what we just heard last night, that time is when? Now. And what you need to know, if, if we don't do what God says, God's going to find somebody who will. Oh, he's not going to leave it undone. 
He's going to find somebody who will get that job done. In fact, to me, I'm still haunted by the time that I, I was prompted to do something. I'm having, I, I'll step on an elevator. This is in Gainesville, Florida. I was pastoring at Trinity in Ocala, and I step on an elevator. And uh, the, when, when I walk on, a dude's standing right here. And ding, the, the door shuts. I back up against this wall. Normally, I stand facing him because I like to make people uncomfortable while I'm looking at them. This is fun. But I'm looking at this dude. I said, how you doing, man? He said, life stinks, man. Ding. And the door opens. And I turn around, and I walk off the elevator. Can I tell you that I am still haunted today by that experience? Because here's a man who openly confessed, I need my job. You know what I said? Not right now. I'm too busy. i got some work to go in my mind, or I would have chased him down, but I didn't. I'm haunted by that experience. To this day, I feel bad about it. I can guarantee you that all of us as followers of Christ, as followers of Jesus, there are those times that God prompts us to do something, and we think, I need to do this. I can do this. I would be good at doing this. I should do this, but not today. And we put it off. I'm not going to do this, Jonah said. Here I am, God. But I ain't going. I, I'm not going. I don't even like those people. Here's a second response. The second one is Moses. And this is what Moses said. He said, here I am, Lord, but send somebody else because I have a little trouble speaking at times. I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him to let my people go. You want me to do what, Lord? I can barely talk sometimes. He had some kind of speech impediment. I don't know what it was. But here I am, Lord, but send somebody else because I'm not qualified. This is something that Moses would have agreed needed to happen. But instead of saying, sure, God, I'll go, Moses said to God, I, Lord, you, you send somebody else. I, I don't want to go to Pharaoh. I'm not qualified. And how many of us in this room feel like we can't go invite somebody to church or we can't go do something or we can't go minister to somebody because I'm just not qualified. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I'm not good enough. Phil, you have no idea my thought life yesterday, so I don't feel qualified to go and do some work for Jesus because he's called me to do something. Y'all look this way. We put so many people in these qualification brackets, and if they don't fit inside these brackets, then they're disqualified from ministry. I remember when, when the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders of the day started making lists of when the, when the Messiah comes, we will know it's him when he heals somebody. He gives sight to the blind. He raises the dead. And he even raises himself from the dead. Then we will know. Do you know he did all of those things and they still didn't believe? They were so religious that they would pull people in and say, all right, who are going to be our Talmud? The students, the ones who walk in the dust of the rabbis and learn from them. Who are going to be the students? And they would only pick certain qualified ones because if they didn't have a good reputation and they didn't study hard and they didn't do well, they made the, the, the religious leaders look bad. Do you realize every one that they rejected is the one Jesus came in and said, Hey, I like you. Come with me. Hey, I like you. Come with me. I would have been one of those who got rejected. And Jesus would have said, Hey, I can do something for you. Come on, if you're just willing to go with me, go with me. And we feel qualified and we'll let, we'll let Satan put us in that bondage of shame and we spend the rest of our life feeling unqualified and doing nothing to move the kingdom forward. And there's a lot of people missing out, including you. Including you, young people. There's a lot of people in your school who are missing out on being a part of this group right here because we don't feel qualified. Well, you don't know, man. I said some things ugly to this person, and a lot of people heard me, so if I go about them to church, I'm going to be embarrassed. We'll tell you how to fix that. When you step out of bounds and you say something ugly or you do something wrong, go to those people and say, hey, I blew it at Trinity today. I'm sorry. I did something I shouldn't have done. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I blew it. Moms and dads, that, that's a pretty cool out, too, if we get in a fight. Everybody say the words, I'm sorry. You kill no, nobody drop dead. Hey, I'm sorry I blew that. I, I, I didn't mean to be ugly. I didn't mean to be sharp with my tongue. I didn't mean to be hateful. We, we, he didn't feel qualified. It's so easy for us to do this. I, I'm, I'm not going to give. 
because I don't have enough to give, but yet it was the widow's might that made the book. Not the rich people who were giving. It was the widow's might who made this book. Oh, somebody else will give. Somebody else will teach. Somebody else will go serve. Somebody else will go buy the watch battery. Let somebody else deal with it. Here I am, God. Send somebody else. And Jonah says, here I am. I'm not going. And then Isaiah the prophet comes along. Watch this. Isaiah prays a very, very dangerous prayer. And so did any to me. Isaiah, flip there in your Bible if you will. Chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And look at verse 8. Chris, it's good to see you, man. Chris was said, my church in Ocala, Florida at Trinity. And man, I'm glad you're here, bro. Isaiah chapter 6, that was my ADD moment right there. We're back, we're back, we're back. Isaiah chapter 6, he says, Also I heard, this is Isaiah, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Question mark. Then I said, this is Isaiah, Here am I, send me. Notice what Isaiah said in the prayer response back to God, but notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, but is the climate nice? Is the weather good? My daughter keeps asking me to come to Chad, Africa. It is 106 degrees in their house right now. I'm not going. Okay? Every time she asks me to come, I said, what's the weather like? And it's always 100 plus. Fat people sweat. I'm not going. I'm not going. He didn't ask what the weather was. He didn't ask what the cost of living was. He didn't ask, are there any benefits? He didn't ask how much vacation time I'm getting. Can I tell you, when we were on the road, Kelly and I combined probably made close to $100,000 a year. Combined. She worked and had a very good job. We left that, and I went to Millington, Tennessee, when I came off the road from singing and took a church position for $28,000 a year. I'm crossing Mont Eagle in a U-Haul truck and I'm weeping and my son says, Dad, what's wrong? I said, we either serve the biggest God on planet Earth or your daddy's the biggest idiot on planet Earth. But you know what? I didn't ask what the pay was. The question was, God, do you want me to go to Millington, Tennessee? That's the question. And it's obvious I've not gone hungry. It's obvious. So God takes care of us. How do we fully surrender our lives to God? I want to try to answer this question. When we look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, I want you to look at the verses that lead up to that surrendered prayer from the prophet Isaiah. Three things, if you will, very quick. If, if you're taking notes, write these down. I hope you will. Number one, we need a genuine experience with the presence of God. That's what took place with Isaiah. Why was he in a position to say, here am I, send me? Because he had understood what it meant to have a genuine experience with the presence of God. Look at verse 1. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So what we see happen here is Isaiah saw the presence of the Lord. He saw him in all of his majesty. He saw him in all of his glory. He saw, he, he witnessed the presence of King Jesus. And if you and I, Want to say, here am I, send me. We've got to witness the presence of Jesus for yourself. Because once you've seen it and once you've experienced it, you want others to be a part of that, do you not? We, we do. The text goes on to talk about these angelic beings named seraphim. And all these angelic beings were worshiping God and they were praising God and they were lifting up God and they were crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah saw this. So why would he not want to go for him? Why would he not want to be a part of that? When Isaiah saw the presence of God and experienced the glory of God, it completely transformed Isaiah's life. Now, why is it that we might not be very available to God? i tell you why. Perhaps it's because we're not walking in the presence of God. If we wake up to our own agendas, and that's all we're concerned about, I'm telling you, you're not going to experience the presence of God like you can. Our agendas have to be, God, I know i got a ton of stuff to do today, but I want to walk in your presence, so what do you want to do in and through me? And I'm telling you, he's going to redeem that time. 
He's going to redeem your time. But when we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Then why is it maybe we're not as available to God as we should be? And maybe it's because we haven't sought after him in a while. Listen, if I can leave you with anything on Wednesday before we go back to Rome, Georgia, is seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And understand all these other things will be added unto you. But yet we seek all the other things and when it don't work out and we get tired and we get weary, then we start seeking God. No, backwards. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things shall be added unto you. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His glory was everywhere. Why do we need to fully surrender to God? We need a genuine experience with the presence of God. Are you experiencing that? I'm going to tell you, we've experienced it this week. We've seen the presence of God moving in people's lives. Now, what do we got to do to hold on to that? We got to continue to seek the presence of God. That's it. Lay our agendas to the side and seek it. But secondly, we need a genuine awareness of our sinfulness. Okay? So we, we have an experience with the presence of God, and then we become aware of the sin that's in our life. In fact, I'm going to argue that one of the biggest cultural lies that people live in today is that I'm a good person. Y'all look this way. The Bible says there is none good, no, not one. It says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are not a good person and neither am I. We're just not. There's some wicked things that can come from us if we're not walking in the Spirit and in the presence of God. We've got to understand that. And if we do, it'll change us. Let me, let me tell you this. Without Christ, we're, we're subject to do anything. I think I told you the other night, but, but my wife, one day we were sitting there and we were watching something on TV and something on news came on and I've watched very little of that. And it was a heinous crime, man. It was ugly. It was awful. And my wife said, I, don't, I can't believe that. I can never do that. And she was sincere. I said, please don't say that. If you let somebody hurt your babies, you would do anything. Listen, we're capable of anything. We've got to understand that. We're wicked. You're wicked. I'm wicked. We're evil. We're sinners apart from Jesus. But in Christ, we're we're none of that. So it was when Isaiah saw the goodness of God, he realized the badness of himself. He saw how holy God was, and in that moment, he recognized his own unrighteousness. It was a genuine awareness of his sinfulness. In verse 5, he cries out, Woe to me. He cried, I am ruined. Man, he saw the holiness of God, and man, he crumbled. I'm unrighteous. He's full of glory. I'm full of sin. Woe to me, he says. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean what? Lips. And I live among a people of unclean what? Lips. And my eyes have seen the king of glory. So I'm a man who's unclean. I live among the unclean, but I have seen the glory of God. I've experienced the presence of God. And what does it take to get to a place where we're fully surrendered, where we say, here am I, God, I'm your, send me? I simply believe it takes a genuine experience with the presence of God. It takes a genuine awareness of our sinfulness, and it takes a genuine understanding of God's grace. Because if you understand how holy God is, and you've seen his presence, and you understand how sinful you are, if you don't understand his grace, then we go into hiding and shame. We, we just we crawl over in a corner. We cave in for the rest of our lives because we don't understand the grace of God. When we understand just how amazing His grace is, it brings us to a point of full surrender. Surrender because we know we can't do anything, but He can do all things. He can do all things. Watch this, Isaiah 6, 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hands a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. What, so what happens here? He saw the presence of God. He recognized, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. And with one touch of the goodness of God, his sins were forgiven and completely atoned. Clean. Clean. With one touch of the goodness of God. We can only imagine this. Our, listen, our lying lips forgiven. Anybody ever told a lie? Can I see your hand? Your hand's not up. You're lying. 
He just told one. Our lies forgiven. Hey, our lying lips forgiven. Our lustful attitude. Anybody ever had a lustful attitude? Go ahead, admit it. Okay, because if you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. You're back to number one. How about self-centered thoughts? Forgiven. Why? Because you've been touched by the goodness of God. Lying lips forgiven. How about angry outburst? Anybody ever had one of them? Forgiven. Cleansed. Every secret sin that you've ever, never told anybody. Y'all look this way. Forgiven. When touched by the goodness of God. God separates our sin. The Bible said as far as the east is from the west, he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. He does not remember your sins anymore. So when we ask God to forgive and then we crawl over in the corner and we keep whining about our sin, he's going, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I, for I forgave that. That's gone. But we're the ones. Satan would have us wallowing around in it completely ineffective. And when we understand the grace of God, it transforms everything. The same way the coal touched the lips and removed his guilt is the same way the blood covers our life and removes sin. So the coal touches lips. So young people, let me ask you, maybe you've looked at stuff you shouldn't look at. Maybe you've been involved with other kids in school that, in a way that you shouldn't be involved in. Hey, that's not just for kids. That's for adults too. I've never seen so many people bailing out on marriages in my life. This I can guarantee you. When I see a divorced couple, here's what I know. Somebody quit somewhere along the way. And you may say, Phil, you don't have a clue what I've walked through. I'm, I'm not judging you whatsoever. Because if not for the grace of God, so go Kelly and I. She should have left me 35 years ago. But because she loved Jesus, she was committed to him. She stayed with me. And she gave God a chance with Phil. And she'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. I confess that. Listen, when we recognize that we don't bring anything to the table, but Jesus brings everything, then the touch of God happens. Then the touch. When we sense God's presence, when we're aware of our sinfulness, and then we experience the unmatched, undeserved grace of God through Jesus Christ, our only responsible response at that point is, Here am I, God. Send me. Well, Pastor Phil, you don't understand, man, I still struggle with alcohol. Well, what if you stopped and you help that dude at the store and you understand he's on alcohol and you can begin to share with him how God is delivering you? Because he don't want to hear from somebody who's not been hooked on alcohol. He wants to hear from somebody who understands what he's talking about. Just what if? What if in our pain and all of our hurt we stop and minister to somebody? only to find out that that ministry was more for our healing than it was for their healing. So the reason is one decision that we have to make today is we have to learn to die to ourselves on a daily basis. From this moment forward, there is a war going on inside of us. There's, there's the flesh side of us, and that means that selfish desires kick in and want to rule our lives. But if we will turn to God and say, God, in spite of all my faults, you've covered my sin, you love me, you've touched me with your goodness, and here am I, send me in spite of my scars and my flaws and my wrinkles, in spite of my age, send me to do something I can do. Y'all look this way. As we get older, God's not expecting us to climb on roofs and change shingles on a roof. But he, amen. I'm not going to. I'm scared to heights, and if fat boy falls from that far up, that sudden impact's going to be deadly. But now you want to sit down with a cup of coffee and dive into somebody's life and say, hey, what's going on with you? And let me walk you through that you can make it. You can make it. Our only response can be, here am I, Lord, send me. L listen, I I'm yours, God. Do anything in me you want to do. God, whatever it is you want to do, send me. Your spirit wants to do what God wants you to do. Here am I, God, send me. So how do we learn to daily choose to die to our flesh so our spirit can live? Here it is. It's simple. You ready? How can I learn to live daily for Christ and kill our flesh, suppress it? 
Whatever we feed grows and whatever we starve dies. Gratitude. If you're feeding yourself the Word of God, you're filled with the Spirit of God, you grow. But if you're not in the Word of God, you will spiritually die. It's just true. Matter of fact, is Brother Ronnie in here? Not tonight. Ronnie was telling Kirk and I a story. He wouldn't mind me sharing this. But Brother Ronnie teaches Sunday school in your church, right? He's your Sunday school teacher. Can I see your hand? He, he understands what we understand who teach the Word of God. And if you ever want to grow like you've never grown in the Word, teach a Sunday school class. I'm just telling you. And he said he was growing so much, and then all of a sudden what took place is when COVID hit, he found himself not going to a Sunday school book on a regular basis. And he said it wasn't long into that he thought, you know what? I'm becoming malnourished spiritually. Just a few days off, a few weeks off, and the next thing he knew, he was starting to starve the spirit because he wasn't doing what he was regularly doing. Does that make him a bad person? No, I think he's pretty wise because he recognized it and he changed it. Whatever you feed flourishes. Whatever you starve dies. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I die daily. If you're like Phil Wade, it may be moment by moment by moment in some areas of your life. So it means that I'm dying to myself every single day so that Christ can live through us. He said, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives within me, the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. You know what that word crucified, when the Bible talks about taking up your cross, it means to take up your instrument of death. Strap on your electric chair, strap in, turn it on, die to self, let the Spirit of God fill you and go get it on again. That's what it means. So when this happens, our response is, yeah, God, I hear you. I, I, I mean it. But, but God, you know what? I don't like those people, but I'm still in. Because you love them. I need to love them. So I'm going to go love them up. I'm going to go share Jesus with them. They're not my favorite kind of people. Maybe they've hurt my feelings, but you told me to go love on them, so God, I'm in. I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. I want to show the same kind of love to mankind that you've shown to me. God, I'm in. Sign me up. So here I, here I am, God. Send me. Why is it that more Jesus followers don't pray this prayer? For some, it could be because maybe they hadn't thought about it. For others, I'm thinking probably they're afraid because it's so stinking bad. Because when you pray that kind of prayer, God's not going to let you just sit in that seat and go, boy, that was a good sermon, preacher. That's good music, Bruce. Praise the Lord. See, y'all Wednesday. Hope supper's good. Now he's going to have you stop at the convenience store and go buy somebody a watch. He's going to have you go do something that's way out of your comfort zone. I got a, I got a slide I, I want to show you. Listen, well, listen. Let, let me just say this before I show you the slide. Some of you are, are afraid to pray this prayer because you're afraid God's going to send you to Africa and you will have to use the bathroom where they don't have toilets. Some of you are afraid to go teach a Sunday school class. That may be what he calls you to do. He may call you to serve in the church. He may cause you to serve the two-year-olds in this church, which is kind of like going to Africa because they don't use toilets either. I don't know. I don't know what he's liable to call you to do. But most people won't sign on because you're afraid of what God's going to call you to do. Can I tell you something? Whatever he calls you to do, he equips you to do. And he's wanting to rock your world if you'll just say, I'm in. Here am I, God, but I'm not going. Here am I, God, but send somebody else because I'm not qualified. Or here am I, God, send me because you touched me with your goodness. 
and I can't keep it for myself. I want you to look at this picture. That picture won a Pulitzer Prize in photography. The most renowned prize that you could win in photography. This, this picture was taken in southern Sudan when famine hit that land, and it's still a famine city. But in 1993, Kevin, uh, I think his last name is Carter, Kevin Carter, was walking through southern Sudan when he saw this. What you don't see is to the right of this picture, about 100 yards, is a food center that this baby boy is trying to get to. And he didn't make it. And now the photographer, instead of helping this child, is setting to wait to watch the buzzard pounce on this baby. Because the buzzard's about to eat the child. He goes home, two months later, he wins the Pulsar Photography Award. And several weeks later, this man takes his own life because he knew he missed the opportunity to save a life only to win a prize that was tempted. So here's what I'm telling you. That's a true story. That's a true picture in Southern Sudan. And that's right where my, uh, my children serve. In Southern Sudan. You have an opportunity to be the food pantry, but not somebody who sits in the food pantry and say, Oh, come on in. This is the typical church. Come on in. We'll feed you when you get here. But can I tell you, not everybody makes it to the food pantry. <laughs> not everybody makes it in the doors of the church. Not everybody feels welcome in the doors of the church. Not everybody's been invited to the doors of the church. Not everybody's been raised to understand church. So we can be the food pantry. Or we can be the buzzer. We can be waiting on people to just die and then say, yeah, Man, you should have given your heart to Jesus. Well, I hope they were saved. Or we can be this stinking photographer who stands there all for an award and watches a vulture take a child when he could have picked that child up and possibly saved that little boy's life. Only a hundred or so yards away. But if you're the one who says, here am I, God, but I'm not enough, then we're no different from the church. We're no different from the people who were running the food pantry. Here somebody else, then we are no different than all of them. But if you've been touched by the hand of God, then we can't help but say, here am I, God, whatever it looks like. Send me. Send me to the classrooms where nobody wants to sit. Send me to the lunchroom to sit with the kids nobody else is sitting with. Send me to walk down the hall and see the one standing over on the side that nobody's talking to or somebody's bullying and say, hey, what's going on here? Or you can be too cool and pull to the side and wait on your award while you take snapshots of your fall. That's the same with us. Our community is full of the fall. And they're dying left and right. And we have an opportunity to pray a dangerous prayer that will get us out of the boat, but it'll get us to walk on this boat. The question is, do you do it? That's my challenge. That's my challenge. Phil Wade makes a lot of mistakes, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to stay out of the boat. I'm going to keep walking. I don't care how painful it gets. I refuse to live my life. I refuse. I tried it. There's no satisfaction in it. It's no fun. And when I try to do it myself, I botch it up. So for Phil, here are my God, send me. Warts and all. 
gray hair and old. Going on 59 and all. Here am I, God sees me there. Question is, are you? Are you Jonah? Are you Moses? Are you Derek Williams? With the heads bowed and the eyes closed. Here's what I want to ask you before we pray. Young people, I want you to listen. My biggest concern for anybody in this room, including our young people, is do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you understand that God looked down on sinful mankind, understanding that they cannot save themselves, so he disrobes from that royal robe? He takes on human flesh. He comes to planet Earth, born in a cattle stall, and immediately had kings of this world euthanizing babies just to try to get to him and kill him. He did that for you. He did that for me. He didn't have to, but he did that for us. So that you and I could understand that regardless of where you've been and what you've done, that he loves you. And he wants to save you. But the first thing we have to do is understand the holiness of God. He's holy and we're not. We were born into sin. That wasn't your fault. We'll thank Adam and Eve for that, right? But then we understand that in God's holiness, man, he can save us. He can touch us with his goodness. He can take that shed blood. He can apply it to our sin. And he can save us. But what we have to do is say yes to him. Here am I, Lord, I surrender. So for any of you here who've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, then the time is now. We've prayed dangerous prayers. We've talked about the preciousness of time, and the time is now to know Jesus. So if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you've never said, yes, Father, I accept the gift of your Son, Jesus, and His shed blood as a gift to cover my sin. Step out of heaven, step into my heart. If you've never prayed that, then I want you to look up at me. Nobody else, just you. Have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? Do you want to? That's awesome. Can you come stand up here? That's a big move. I know that's bold. Come here. I'll not let you stand up. Here's one who says, here am I. Send me. How about somebody else? You want to trust Christ tonight? You want to ask him to be your Savior? Don't look at me if now if, if this is not you. You want to trust Christ? Huh? Do you? Will you ask mom to come with you? Will you look at him and say, Mom, will you come with me? Hmm? Just tell her you want to ask Jesus into your heart. I thought she'll come with you. Or dad, I didn't, I'm sorry, I see dad said there. Dad, you come on too. I'm looking. Now don't look up at me unless you you desire to know Jesus as your Savior. Hey, if you're in the balcony, forgive me for being old, but I can't see that far. But if you're in the balcony and you say, Pastor Phil, I want to trust Jesus as my Savior tonight, would you throw your hand up in the air, kind of wave me down? You want to ask Jesus into your heart? Come here. Anybody else? Anybody else? 
and with the heads bowed and eyes still closed, if you work with these students. Jason, I'm going to ask you, can you pull away from up there and somebody else run that? If you work with these students, I'm going to ask you to come up here and stand here. Come on, come on. So, I'm going to talk to you in just a second while everybody else has got their heads bowed. You pulled a prophet Isaiah tonight. What you said is here am I, send me. But first things are always first. We've got to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And in order to do that, we just got to understand our sinfulness compared to his holiness. And maybe those are words too big for some of you. So the reason I've asked the leadership to come down is I'm going to ask you guys to pile up on the altar with him one-on-one, okay? With mom and mom and little man here and dad and then these others. Pile up with him and sat down and walk them through their desire to know Jesus and then pray with them. I mean, you work with them every day. I want you to have the privilege to lead them to Jesus right now, okay? That's what I want you to do. And then when you're done, I want you to bring them to Brother Scott. Tell Brother Scott what you think. And here's what's going to happen. Once you get saved, Brother Scott, in time with these leaders, we're going to talk to you all about baptism. Pretty cool. This coming Sunday, we're going to baptize about 15 or 20 people at our church. It's awesome. I can't wait to get back and clean the water up, and I hope the heater doesn't work because it'll be a cold one they can remember. huh? But baptism doesn't save you. It doesn't make you more saved. But baptism is the wedding band of salvation. If, if I could get this off my fat finger, I would ask you the question, am I still married? And the answer to that question is yes. Because the wedding band doesn't make me married. It just tells the world that I'm married. So when you get saved and then you get baptized, you're telling the world that you've identified with Jesus. So y'all talk to them about what that looks like too because that's the next step. How do we ask God for what's the next step if he's already given it to us and we hadn't done it, right? There needs to be a baptism Sunday or shortly, soon. So y'all pile on the altars with him, get with him, and let's deal with it and then introduce him to Brother Scott. Will you do that? Now, with y'all's heads bowed and your eyes still closed, my question to you is, before we sing, is there some of you here that you're stalemate? You love Jesus, but man, you've been okay with just doing church on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday, but my question, who will follow the example of this couple who testified before you tonight and say, I'm going to walk out these doors and I'm going to make the time right now to go start sharing Jesus with a world in Bowling Green and Wachula that's going to hell. My goal in my heart is that every church become full and every home become a church. What a goal. This church needs to be full of people because there's a lot of hurting people out there. So all I'm asking you to do is pray, God, help me tonight to surrender whatever it is you want me to do. And if God's calling you, I'm going to ask you to step out and come grab Scott by the hand and say, hey, here are my Lord, send me. Scott's not your Lord, but just tell him, say, Scott, I, I'm ready. Wherever the Lord wants to send me, whatever you need me to do to help you minister to this community, I'm here for you. Let's do it. So as we stand and as we get ready to sing, it's time to make a commitment. Father, in Jesus' name, touch the lives of the people in this room. May we not leave here the same way we walked in. In Jesus' name.